Welcome to The Sandbox with Justin Peters, connecting you to the ideas and tools to improve your life. Now let's go. Hello and welcome into The Sandbox. I'm your host, Justin Peters, and I have been having so much fun these last three months interviewing top performers that I believe are crushing it at life. Through these conversations, I've noticed a similar thread. Each one of these top performers are really good at making prudent decisions. And by prudent, I don't necessarily mean safe decisions. Oftentimes, it's the exact opposite. Their ability to take thoughtful risk is what has set them up for an extraordinary life. So I really wanted to explore decision-making a little bit more. And to do that, I invited on today's guest. Today's guest is a Midwest girl. She grew up in Southern Illinois, just outside of St. Louis. Her attachment to her family and her familiarity with home didn't prevent her from making bold decisions though. In this episode, we discuss her decision to go out of state for college, study abroad in Europe, and move to the West Coast to pursue a job after college despite having to do long distance with her boyfriend. I'm hoping this episode gives you the courage to follow your intuition and to make bold decisions. I hope you enjoy my conversation today with Kate Holtz. Hey, Kate, welcome into the sandbox. Hi, Justin. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to have you on. I, whenever I was thinking about guests for for the show, I wrote your name down just because, like, you're someone that I've always really admired, and the fact that, like, whenever we first met each other, I thought you were like really put together for your age. Um, we were, you actually came and worked for me whenever, uh, you did one of your internships. I think that was after your sophomore year. You were still pretty young yep. at that point in time. Right. Yeah. Right. I, uh, and it was fascinating because whenever I, I, I was doing any hiring, I like to ask the question, um, like, would you invest in this person? Like if you, if, if people were, were like companies, would you physically use your money and invest in this person? And someone like yourself is like a no doubter. Like I'm like, dude, I have <laughs> no doubt that whatever Kate wants to do in her life, I, I think she's really got to succeed at. I, I just, I, I really admire that piece to it. You know, one of the attributes I really, really admire about you is just your ability to make some of the right decisions. And that's what I really kind of want to use as our story arc for our conversation today. Okay. Really kind of get in your head about talking about some of the, how you make decisions and some of the big decisions that you've made, you know, everywhere from from college and moving and and relationships and whatnot. But I figured it might be easier to start at, a more recent and minor decision that you made. Whenever okay. I texted you and asked you if you wanted to be on the uh, on my podcast, you you were just like, yeah, sure, no doubt, that sounds awesome. And then during our prep call, uh, it was funny because you got on right away and you're like, oh, I hate the sound of my voice. Like this is like really <laughs> out. Like doing this is really gonna put me outside my comfort zone. But n- never once were you like, I'm not sure if I really want to do this. So I, I want to ask you, like, how, why did you make the decision to say yes to me and, and come on the sandbox today? That's a great question. Thank you for the really great intro. Also, I've al- yeah. always looked up to you. I would consider you one of my very first mentors, probably, especially within the workforce. And it's kind of crazy because whenever we first met, I thought you were so much older than me as a, <laughs> you know, coming sophomore in college and. I was like, he, you know, he has it all together. He's really, he's really old. He must be at least 30 something. He looks young, but he can't be. As and then as I'm, face. this baby face is not 30. <laughs> oh yeah. And then as I got to know you, I'm like, it's kind of crazy just how much the age gap has closed. And now I consider you a, a close friend too. So it's been um, really exciting to follow each other kind of through um, our journeys over the past two years. Mm. I've always uh, looked up to you ever since we did meet, and I admire you sort of just taking anything you do by the horns, and um, you always give everything your all, and um, you starting a podcast, just as you explained to me, is nothing you had experience with, so I figured if you could start your own podcast, then I would survive being on it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for for pushing yourself outside your comfort zone. And I'll ask you some more questions on some decisions you made on that. Uh, but let's start with with childhood for you. And I would really like to paint a picture. Um, where was Kate? What did you know high school look like? Where did you grow up? And you know what what did family dynamic look like? So I was born in Minnesota, but came to small suburbs of St. Louis, so across the border in Illinois. Lived here pretty much as long as I can remember, so since I was three. 
Um, I went to school at a um, smaller private school my entire life. Um, and I would say that was pretty significant. Even uh, my, co or my high school was only about 100 people in my graduating class. You know, there's, I guess, public schools that can be that small too. But uh, I think that was really a defining factor as I was growing up. Uh, I like to have a lot of different groups of friends than versus, you know, just three or four people that you hang out with all the time. I think that's really progressed. I like to hear uh, different ideas, people that have different perspectives. Mm. Um, and, you know, I don't think I realized that was it until I was in college and got older. I think being from a, a smaller town and going to a smaller school kind of with a close knit group, you know, people came in and out, transferred um, from different towns or different schools, but there really was a, a pretty significant group of kids that I went to school with from kindergarten all the way through senior year of high school. Mm. Uh, a lot of people would be maybe over that by the time they graduated. And at the time, you know, you have those feelings and you're ready to move on and do the next big thing. But uh, really the, the sense of close friendship uh, and family has been instilled in me since I was little. Um, and I like forming those deeper connections versus surface level, you know, we hang out on the weekends and I don't really know anything about you or your background. Um, it's nice to have those friends that knew you when you were three and have all of that foundation to say, give you the best advice or be the best friend that they can be and in return you can be um, now. So yeah, that, awesome. That's mm -hmm. my hometown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's that's super fascinating. Actually, I didn't know you grew up in um, Minneapolis, was it? Minnesota? Yep. Okay, yep. cool. Yep, suburb. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. So, um, I, you know, keeping with the story arc of making decisions, I, I think some of the best decision makers don't learn necessarily through their own failures, but observations of other people. You know, uh, making a decision is is has multiple facets to it. It's, you know, you have to understand what choices are out there. You know, you have to understand the significance of each choice and which one might be a, a good prudent decision and and what might not be a bad decision. So, like, I'm a big believer in, sure, of course, learn from your own failures when you make those mistakes. But at the same point, same time, you know, learn from other people's failures or just observations of people making great decisions. So was right. there anybody you know, through your childhood, through high school, maybe even through college, um, that played a role model um, figure in your life that that you really looked up to and that you felt like you really gained a lot of knowledge and it kind of set you set you up for, for life? It might be the, the basic answer, but I think the biggest influence would be my mom. We're alike in a lot of ways, but we're also different in a lot of ways. I think I can see how I felt a lot different from her when I was younger. Uh, I've always had a leader type personality, I guess you could say when I was younger, that was definitely bossiness. Um, <laughs> or it was seen like that by most people, I'm quite sure. My brothers uh, remind me of that often. Mm, mm. But as I've gotten older, I like to think it's become more refined and um, it's the leadership qualities that I feel enable me well in my job and in school in leadership roles, roles in clubs during college. And I can see kind of how those qualities that my mom had as an adult when I was growing up were what my qualities as maybe a bossy little kid have been refined to become. So she was definitely uh, the most influential in that. And then just helping me because, you know, I figured out later that she worked through all of those things too, especially in high school. Uh, how to turn that into leadership qualities uh, versus just telling people what to do all the time and mm. getting mad when you don't get your way. <laughs> yeah, that totally makes sense. So, so maybe the question is like, how do you do that? How does somebody, you know, how does the bossy, uh, you know, teen, you know, teenager or toddler, all the, you know, all the way through these years, how did you grow from from bossy Kate to to leader Kate? I think that's a complicated answer. <laughs> I will say the other kind of influential person that I think helped me do that is maybe a little bit of a less conventional answer, but my twin brother, Danny, uh, growing up with a twin, you know, it's, you have that built in friends and uh, someone that doesn't judge you and generally goes along with what you do, considering 
they did since you were born. Um, we're very opposite in most things. And while I was that, you know, bossy leader type kid, he's always been the most go with the flow ever. So it was me telling him what to do and him doing what I wanted him to do. <laughs> uh, but as we got older, he realized that that wasn't what he wanted uh, and started calling me out on it. And I remember, especially in middle school, he's like, why do you have to be so bossy? And um, I, you know, as much as being called out stinks, and I'm sure I did not take it well at the time, um, you have to have those people, whether it's in the seventh grade or well into your adult life, uh, that tell you how it is. And he continues to do that. Uh, and I think whenever my seventh grade brother called me bossy, it that was definitely the tipping point of where, you know, you start to realize you need to grow up and refine some of your characteristics. Uh, so that kind of played an important role. And then also I think having different leadership positions uh, where I guess by title you have that role in um, clubs in high school and then especially college where you realize that you can't just do it all by yourself and that you mm. usually don't have the best ideas. Um, I, you know, quickly found out it's a lot more about just like bringing people together and maybe having that organizational piece that uh, really helps out, I guess, from a leadership perspective, but it's usually the ideas of other people that come to fruition as being the best, at least in, in my experience, so. Yeah, and I, I honest, honestly, I think that's a big lesson, you know, you and I have similar personalities in that sense, too, like, we are, are natural leaders in the sense of, like, if there needs to be decisions or if there is indecision in a group, you and I don't uh, shy away from stepping up and, and leading a group. But it's tough right. because you and I have to be super aware of uh, when we're being controlling or bossy in that sense. So, yeah. what, you know, is, is, is there anything that you do or that you've learned, um, you know, through your early career or through your involvement with certain clubs um, that help you check maybe that... Uh, characteristic flaw that might creep in if, if you're not being as observant as you should be? I think one part is that I've also learned that sometimes it's fun to just be kind of in the background. Yeah. Um, you know, it goes against innately what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure you understand that, but it's nice. You know, mm -hmm. you listen and you observe and, you know, interject if you have something to contribute but let someone else kind of digest all of that and then figure out where to go with it. It's, it's, it takes practice, but it's nice. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, picking and choosing, there's certain battles or certain teams or experiences or um, meetings that you want to take control over and you should, and there's certain ones that you're probably just better off to kind of sit in the background. So mm -hmm. I don't really think I have, one specific check maybe sort of in my head asking like would I be the best person to step up and get everyone together at this point or is there someone else in the room that could probably do that better yeah that's a big question I actually really like that question I don't I uh, you know understanding your strengths and your limitations and also understanding your teams or or the dynamic of the group's strengths and limitations as well like I've I've had to find I'm the alpha in my relationship and, and Gabby, my, my girlfriend's really the beta in the sense of um, she typically looks to me to make decisions and she's kind of comfortable more so on the following aspect, but I push her a lot, especially in her area of expertise to make some of those decisions. So like we kind of have a lot of clear boundaries on like, hey, you're really great at making this decision. I'm really great at making a decision like this. You know, for example, like if it's a money decision, I might make a money decision, but if it's a travel arrangement decision, she's very good at like the itinerary and understanding logistics and stuff. So I push her, I was like, hey, like, uh, like she, and she's very good at asking, you know, having the involve me. She's like, you know, what about this? Or, or like, you know, should we maybe do this? Or what do you feel like versus me? I'm just like, hey, I think we, we got to do this. Um, and like, I, I, I struggle to reframe some of those times. So it's, it's, right. it's always interesting, but like, I, I now push her a little bit, especially cause I want her to build her confidence as well. Being like, Hey, you, 
you have way more uh, expertise in this area. I think you should probably make this decision and I should go, I should go along with it because I do really, really enjoy sometimes sitting in the passenger seat. Like, especially whenever we go on vacation, I'm just like, dude, it's, I'm checking out. I just want to like relax. And have a good time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. So, um, okay. So g- moving out of childhood and, and talking about college, you know, college, maybe um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but maybe one of your first really significant decisions that you had to make in your life. Correct. Correct. So yep. you, you've already alluded to like uh, that you're really you have a really strong relationship with with your family like your mom being a mentor of yours it seems like you have a really deep relationship with your twin brother and I'm I'm assuming the rest of your siblings and your and your dad as well you have a strong right. relationship with what why did you decide to move out of Southern Illinois to Indianapolis to go to school you know knowing that your family means a lot to you right. I don't really know where the this concept stemmed from, but I just always had in my head I was going to go away to college. Um, my parents were very supportive of that and honestly probably planted that idea very early mm. on. It was just, it was never uh, a question. And if, if I said, I want to stay home and go to a college around here, I'm, I'm sure they would have loved that. But it was just never a question in my mind. I think they instilled in me, like, it's a great experience to go away to college. So, like I said, just, it wasn't really a question. It was just a matter of where. I really thought I wanted to go super far. You know, what I, you know, one of the coasts or south or a plane ride, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, I like to say I quickly realized how impractical that was, Mm -hmm. which once we get to my life now, we can discuss that again. <laughs> but so I started looking after that decision was kind of made at schools around, you know, a four or five hour drive. I always said that I wanted to be close enough that I could get home pretty easily for like an extended weekend, which I didn't end up doing a lot. <laughs> um, but far enough away that my parents couldn't be like, hey, see you in 20. Yeah. Um, so that's that was kind of my um, defining radius. Okay. And so I started looking mostly at private schools. Uh, I worked with uh, someone who had connections at a lot of the private schools and helped us with our college essays and that sort of thing. Uh, so I think that might have been where that started. She was kind of into the smaller liberal arts schools, a lot of them way smaller than I wanted to, to consider. So we kind of had to, you know, push back and forth there. Uh, But my mom and I ended up just doing an Indiana road trip. We did kind of like an Ohio loop and uh, um, like Northern Illinois look. And so we ended up going to Indianapolis and scheduled a tour. I thought it was going to be too small. At this point, I thought I was looking in the range of maybe like 15,000 students. That seemed like the good kind of in between to me at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd ruled out the 30,000 in the 1000 and you know was landed at 15 but um so I toured Butler and honestly it was just a feeling I I think I've told you before that a lot of my major life decisions you could say have been based on a gut feeling Mm -hmm. and how I feel when I'm there and I'm very big on I don't think I could have gone to a school without being on campus and seeing it you know it's hard to get that feeling just from looking at it online, et cetera. Um, so when I was on campus, I just had that gut feeling. I'm like, I really like it here. Um, and everyone was super friendly and approachable. I really liked that. Uh, we walked around campus and everyone waved at you. And um, so those were, were kind of the bigger factors once I finally got to the decision, but it was mm. mostly the gut feeling that, that made it. Yeah, that's super interesting from, um, I would assume, a logical brain having, (laughs) you know, leaning more on intuition and gut feeling because like, you know, and even some of my best decisions, you know, it, I felt, I felt like it, I, it it was just inside me that I had to make that decision. And I, a a recent decision that I hate using the word regret, um, because it has such a negative connotation around it, but definitely a learning lesson a major life decision that I had, I had a gut feeling to go a different direction. And I chose against that. And I was just like, I looking back on it now, like that was a big learning lesson for me is to like, you know, 
if you have a strong feeling, you have some intuition, if you have a gut feeling, just just lean into it because sometimes I overthink uh, my decision making process. <laughs> oh yeah, the the overthinking thing is very very prevalent. Uh, my grandpa always used to say, there you go again, thinking it, <laughs> it was just you know, down the rabbit hole. And it's funny because I do that with even kind of smaller decisions, I guess. Uh, and yeah, the, the bigger, most significant ones have, um, I guess maybe that's what makes them, you know, special or that I knew that it was the, the right choices. I didn't go down this rabbit hole of overthinking everything. I was just like, you know, this is it. I feel it. And let's go yeah yeah i uh i i would be remiss not not to ask you about studying abroad was that a gut decision was that and i'm always going to do this as soon as i started at, at butler where where was your you know how did you decide to study abroad that was on my list actually of when i was looking at colleges oh interesting so again another thing either of my parents went abroad i i really didn't know anyone I don't think personally, maybe older people that graduated from my high school or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but my family had traveled one, just once to Europe. Um, and I just, I thought it was a really great experience. And the thought of going there, you know, by myself seemed very adult and exciting. So whenever I was looking at schools, you know, it wasn't the, the deciding factor, but you know, do they have some sort of study abroad program? Uh, and Butler has a huge program. I think it's close to 30% of students study abroad, maybe mm. even more. I could have mm. butchered that. But um, they have a lot of good programs, either with uh, third party companies or a lot of exchanges where they do exchanges with other universities abroad. Um, I did an actual Butler program, so they sponsor it. It was all Butler students and Butler faculty. So really the, the decision that made, that it was made whenever I knew the program I wanted to go on was where we were going to be going. Mm. So they said Spain, Greece, Italy, and Morocco all in one trip. And I was like, sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Um, <laughs> I'd always wanted to go to Greece. You know, you see the pictures online and it's, yes. it looks just like that. So I knew I wanted to go there. I had been to Rome and Paris. So um, Spain was something different. And then Morocco just seemed super cool and out there. Um, so as soon as I heard those, it was a whole application process. And obviously those places were um very competitive. A lot of people wanted to go. Um, so I wasn't sure if it would end up working out and was really lucky that it did. Uh, we ended up not going to Morocco, which was a big bummer. It was um, during a lot of political turmoil and um, they didn't let us go. So that's definitely on my bucket list to get back to. Mm -hmm. I will say you talk about uh, regret or maybe just a learning experience yeah I will say I wish I just did like a direct exchange and went somewhere by myself and lived in a different city and had a roommate I didn't know and professors at a different university um, it was it was definitely a growing experience but spending three months with the same professors and the same 20 people was um interesting at times <laughs> and also made me feel like I wasn't necessarily immersing myself in the culture mm. in different ways it did because they set up different experiences um, we did a lot of service type days um, and had a lot of experience like with refugees in Greece and those were very cool and I don't think I would have you know stumbled upon those myself so that that was very rewarding um, and and re that was very helpful in kind of the culture and le um, learning about the people and meeting people that that live there. But overall, uh, it was almost like a big vacation versus like living and studying uh, in a different place. So I wish I would have had like one home base and then, you know, made all my travels around and met up with people and that sort of thing. I think that was one of the biggest things I would have changed from college, actually. Mm. 
Awesome. Like that's, that's super fascinating. Um, and, and interesting that, that you actually could admit that as well. Uh, I applaud you for studying abroad. It's, it's a, um, it's an experience I wish I would have followed through with whenever I was in college as well. Um, but the fact that like you wanted to go even more outside your comfort zone of like, Hey, I'm, I've got to go hang out in Europe for, for a semester and really push myself to be in these different cultures. And then like looking back on it now and being like, i I think I wanted to even I wanted an even bigger challenge um, is is super uh, admirable, I think, in that sense. And I, I think um, that's definitely a learning experience and something like whenever I make decisions, I look at it as like, man, I could have probably even made a bigger decision, like something like starting this podcast right here. I was like right. so up about it for like six months before I finally pulled the trigger and did it, recorded, sent out my first episode. And then you wait, you like sit back and you wait and you're just like, oh my gosh, what are people gonna think? Like how many people like, I uh, make a random podcast and then send it out. And then like, it was cool. Cause I like got so many people, you know, so many responses back and people would be like, oh, that was awesome. Like, I can't believe that you're making like, that you like went out there and you're like, you know, publishing something so personal as a, a podcast. And now yeah. I look at it, you know, episode number 10 here being like, man, I could, I could have done this and I could have pushed myself even further in some of this. And I keep trying to do some of that piece to it. So right. I, I want to talk about uh, a decision you made that pushed you, I think, a little bit outside your comfort zone in moving to San Francisco. Um, so I would love to hear just like what, you know, maybe, maybe we should start, you know, take a step back and like what made, you know, what made you consider San Francisco as a place for post-college for you? It was a little bit of an unconventional route to get there. Um, so I was set on staying in Indianapolis. I was going to stay there. I was looking at apartments. I knew who my roommate was going to be, had a job offer. That that was going to be my life. And I'd always wanted to stay there ever since being at Butler. It really felt like home and, and not just all of my friends being there, but the people and the, the city itself. And I... Uh, I love it and still do. So I was in the risk management and insurance program, and I had uh, one of the best um, advisors. He's the director of the program. Should have shouted him out and people that uh, have really influenced my life, but he'll get the shout out now. <laughs> uh, Zach, Finn, <laughs> Zach Finn is the director of the program at Butler and has really built it up from nothing to what it is now, which is pretty significant, especially um, in the Midwest and sending, you know, graduates out of the program to San Francisco and the East Coast and um, winning different competitions. And um, so it's, you know, something I'm really proud of and proud to be a student out of his program. And he knows me extremely well, knew that I wanted to stay in Indy, kept kind of pushing on me about different job other offers elsewhere. Um, I wasn't going to do the insurance thing, but I wasn't sure if I was really ready to give that up because I put so much in to the program and, you know, organizations associated with it um, and like it a lot too as a, a field. So he approached me one day and was like, hey, I know you want to stay here, but I have a student that now lives in San Francisco and her team wants to hire someone that's similar to her and I think you're just like her so you should talk to her <laughs> mm. and and I was like yeah yeah you could name literally any city in the whole country besides San Francisco and I would think about it but I can't afford to live there mm. and it's really far and I don't think I'm a west coast gal and <laughs> I just don't think it's for me and he's like well just think about it and so about a month went by and he would kind of bring it up in small doses, but we really didn't talk too much about it again. And then he's like, okay, so the San Francisco thing, they still want somebody. So will you just set up a call with, with Aaron? And I was, you know, just kind of to get him off my back. I was like, sure, Finn, I'll set up a call and I'll talk to her. And so I called her on my way home from work and, you know, we are pretty similar, especially in our path at Butler and the major and um so we got along well which wasn't very shocking and that conversation turned into her setting up a couple of phone interviews and I was like you know it won't hurt you know I just, <laughs> just talk to people why not um and then that turned into me flying out to San Francisco this is all within about two weeks 
Wow. Um, so then I flew out there. I was only there for 24 hours. Uh, really liked everyone I met and liked the, you know, three blocks of the city that I saw. But yeah, I called my mom from my Uber on the way back to the airport from the long day of interviews and meeting people. And I was like, you know, I think I'm moving to San Francisco. Wow. <laughs> and she was like, really? Already? And she said that she had hoped that I would just have this gut feeling again um, that I wouldn't be wishy-washy like should I do it should I not do it I don't know um, and she's like I really just hope that either you would love it or you would hate it and you wouldn't have to go through this whole period of well what if should I mm. um, so yeah again it was just the feeling and, and I think just the the right timing to you know I really believe in that too and you know I'm religious, so call it faith or fate or whatever you want. Um, but I also think that things happen at the right time in the right place how they should. And at that point, I wasn't so sure about my job in Indianapolis. I wanted something in insurance. Then, you know, I was prodded for a long time about this, and I finally talked to them. And then, you know, so things just sort of fell into place, even though it was literally the opposite of the plan I'd had, you know, since junior year, even earlier. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. So, uh, wow, yeah. there's a lot to unpack there. What, what maybe what fears did you have to overcome uh, in order to get yourself to move to San Francisco? I mean, you mentioned the price and how far away it was. Um, were these things you were telling yourself or working yourself up? Or was there anything that you really had to work through in order to get yourself to actually move to San Francisco? I think Honestly, when I made the decision, I don't think I had worked through a lot of those things. A lot of that actually ended up being on the back end because mm. the process happened so quick. And then I made the decision and then I was kind of like, okay, now we're coming back to reality. And wow, there's all these factors that have to happen. So I think I started to you know, work up to thinking through things, um, but really didn't, didn't maybe before. Uh, making the decision but it was leaving all of my friends my boyfriend in Indianapolis my family that was only a four-hour drive away and now it was going to be four-hour plane ride or more with a layover usually yep yeah um and also just a different city you know I had never been to the west coast ever and the first time I did was for my interview. And the second time was when I moved there with wow. all of my things permanently to with my roommates that I had never met. <laughs> I love them dearly now. Which is really <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was really all of those things, the connections, ha never, never living out of the Midwest. I guess I consider myself pretty Midwestern mm -hmm. growing up here and going no, I thought going to Butler was so far, but it's still the Midwest and people are very similar to home. So uh, those were all all different factors. Hmm. What uh, what obstacles, you know, I, I would I would love to hear from you first, but like what major obstacles did you have to overcome whenever you first moved to San Francisco? Well, there was a lot, <laughs> you know, there's the physical obstacles as in how do you get all of your stuff? Oh, yeah. <laughs> San Francisco. Um, that was one of the main things. I got a great, uh, I got some great advice from Erin, who was the person who went to Butler, and she is now on my team at work. And she said she moved from Indiana out uh, to San Francisco. And she said she, she and her parents took a Southwest flight, and she used all of their checked bags. Mm. <laughs> And I was like, you know, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And the <laughs> challenge, which ended up taking about three weeks of my life in July before I moved. So I had seven bags, mine and my parents' carry-ons, which was six, and then my own. And they both packed in a carry-on suitcase for a week that they were there wow. because there wasn't any room left. And my dad and I reorganized <laughs> everything so many times. They were all under 50 pounds. They were all about 48. <laughs> and we made it and I even took my bedding and we took a power drill wow. and you know some things didn't make the cut of course but yeah. we we pretty much got it all in so that was 
you know, maybe one of the most significant challenges. Yeah, I mean, um, man, the logistics was a nightmare. I drove out to San Diego. So luckily, I had like, all the square footage in my car to like pack all my stuff in but I have a a Ford Fusion so it's not like I had a ton so yeah you got to pick and choose like what you really want but I I found probably you know outside of you know some of the early hassles of moving which is totally rewarding I think anybody that's considering um, moving out of their hometown they haven't been somewhere before I really especially if you're young and you don't have obligations like like kids or or certain things back home I 100% challenge people to go to a different city because um, you know studying abroad moving to a new city and being in a new city um, you know, even, you know, going out of state for, for college are all things that now I look back on. And I think they're really important decisions that I'll probably push my kids to make just because I think they're all really great opportunities to learn and grow. But right. the, the thing that that challenged probably me the most was like making friends. Like it's like you move yep. to a new area and especially like you're by yourself and it's like making those early friendships, especially if you um, were, you know, grew up in the same area pretty much your entire life. Um, you're, you you're not used to like having to refill every single one of those friend slots. It's like, you right. know, have some friends from middle school and high school and college and this, this team sport that I played and that club that I was involved with. And, you know, everybody's still relatively around or near. So, but then you right. go and you're like completely blank slate in a new city and you're just like, holy cow. So how did you, how did you make some friends whenever you first moved to San Francisco? Right. You're completely right. It is very hard. I, we're people, people also. Mm-hmm. So yeah. <laughs> the idea of sitting in my apartment by myself for longer than one night just gives me a rush of anxiety. Yep. <laughs> um, so that was definitely something that I was very scared about. You know, I knew I would have coworkers, but I wanted to have friends that weren't just my coworkers. Also, mm-hmm. that was really a big a priority for me. I I think it's important to have, you know, different groups of friends and meet people in different ways. That was definitely something that I was concerned about. I got lucky, as I said, with kind of built-in friends at the beginning because I have two roommates um, and they've become my best friends out in mm-hmm. San Francisco. So like I said, extremely lucky there. And they are were great even from the, you know, the first weekend of taking me to hang out with their coworkers and their friends. And I've become friends with a lot of their different groups now too, which mm. has been really fun. The other, my other really good friend is actually from work, but she works in a completely different group on a different floor. Uh, work was kind of able to facilitate us meeting each other. And, you know, sometimes there's, you know, young professional happy hours, but uh, I consider her a non-work friend that I met at work, which um, was super cool that there was a lot of us young people right out of college and and we got to have the opportunity. So Mm. I'd say work and then roommates and otherwise I haven't made a ton of other friends. (laughs) I will say, I mean, it's hard to go on, you know, some like Bumble friend date or something. It's just not my not my thing with you know maybe I should push myself out of my comfort zone I think what I really have realized honestly though is you don't have to have a ton of friends you just need a few quality friends Mm -hmm. which is something you always hear but had never been necessarily my experience um and I I mean I know that's the case now because I have what I would consider maybe five good friends and San Francisco and I hang out with them and some of their friends or a mixture of them you know most weekends and um and it works and not you know bored of them or you know know, none of that so it's it yeah it's really been that's been a good learning experience yeah yeah I, I would agree with that as well um you know as you age and get older you realize it might be more quality over quantity when it comes to friendships yeah. and you get busy with so many other facets of your life like your health and wellness and your career and um your 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 relationship and whatnot so that like you realize you you only have a finite amount of time and you got to spend time doing certain things and you'd rather just spend your time building friendships with the people that really mean something to you and that you really want to engage in. So I, 
I 100% agree with that. So I want to ask you about, um, you know, you know, speaking of best friends, I want to ask you about your boyfriend, uh, Taylor. How did that conversation go whenever you decided um, that you might be moving, what is it, like 2,300 miles away from him? <laughs> Something while, like that. Yeah, yep. while he stays back in Indianapolis. I'm assuming you wanted to be together, but... Uh, right. you know, how, how did that discussion go whenever, you know, you know, deciding that you were going to try to, that you were going to do long distance now? He was involved, you know, kind of throughout the process. So it at least wasn't some rash out of nowhere type thing. He knew I was having the phone call and then he knew I was having the phone interviews. And I think we both at that point were just like, this is just for fun and, you know, it's not going <laughs> to happen. And then I went there and I, I couldn't tell you what was going through his mind, probably a lot of things as was mine. Um, Cause at that point it was, you know, this trip and adventure for me. And um, it was, it was exciting. And then I got back and after, I told my mom and then of course he was the um, other person I told first. I'm like, you know what? I really think I, I think I want to move to San Francisco. And there was never a doubt in my mind that we, wouldn't make it work and that we would keep dating you know it was never a, I'm gonna leave San Francisco and we're not gonna date it just it was it just really never crossed my mind and I don't think it really ever crossed his either mm. um, we had both planned on being in Indianapolis but we wanted to you know kind of keep moving in our relationship and you know eventually get engaged and all of those you know life things that we talked about and I think for both of us, it, this was just sort of, uh, okay, we're going to do this and see where it goes and eventually end up back in the same spot. Um, I try, we've talked about this multiple times. I try not to look at San Francisco as a temporary thing. It's, it's kind of hard with all of, you know, him and friends and family being in the Midwest. But I think the biggest thing is just he's been supportive of, uh, especially from, well, I guess a personal and career perspective. He's like, you have the best opportunity for your job and what you want to do right now there. And mm -hmm. I think even if I did a similar job somewhere else, it wouldn't be the same. Um, just the clients and uh, tech in the Silicon Valley, it's just, um, it's, it's an incredible experience. I'm, I feel very lucky to be there. But um, he's just been, been supportive from the beginning and and wanting me to kind of do this for me. And, you know, at, at some point later on, he's going to want to do something for him and I'm going to want to do something else for myself. And, you know, I think that's kind of our perspective as we move past it is, you know, even though we're a couple and we make a lot of decisions together and, and that's very important. You also have to make decisions for yourself and sometimes do what's best for yourself, especially when the timing works and this, mm -hmm. um, I think is really just the best time to kind of be selfish because it still works. And, you know, we just have each other and not, you know, a family or other responsibilities. Um, so I think really it's just being supportive of each other and, and realizing that we're both kind of living our personal dreams out right now. And, you know, sounds cheesy, but then later on it will, you know, come back together and be ours again. So mm. Mm, that's cute. And you guys, you guys met in college, right? Right at Butler. Okay. Yeah. Um. So you you re you never really did distance, you know. Maybe you know you had to you know go a little bit of time through a break, you know, winter break or summer or something like that, correct? Right. So it yeah we never had done anything close to it, which was interesting. Um. But so we started dating my junior year, so that was two years at Butler and then that summer I stayed and had an internship in Indianapolis so mm -hmm. and he was there so we stayed there then um we were both there and then yeah I think the longest was maybe like two we would even like he would come to St. Louis over break so it was probably <laughs> it was probably 10 days or so. <laughs> I love that I love um, that so how, how yeah. are you making, how did you, how did you make distance work for you? You know, long distance being new to you, what things, uh, what specific things did you implement or work on to make sure that you were still growing in your relationship? 
I think for the first few months, it was really just kind of like survival mode Mm -hmm. versus anything really more than that. It was, we were both, you know, busy and trying to do our thing and figure out kind of our new lives. He was just starting rotations versus being in class. Um, So it got to a certain point after, you know, two or three months of that, that we're like, okay, the newness is wearing off. We can't be in survival mode for years. So we need to kind of slow down, let ourselves one, I think, realize that we are apart and this isn't just, you know, this three month whirlwind. But I think that took a lot of kind of humility and just, I mean, it was difficult to just let us both process this is a long term thing. Um, So really just admitting that that was the situation that we were in. And then honestly, what's worked best for us is not setting anything too formal in terms of you know we can we FaceTime every Wednesday or something like that um it's really I think the biggest thing has been patience and and really understanding of each other's schedules because a lot of times I'm at work and a happy hour comes up and it's great opportunity with you know someone high up on the team or with a client and you know I he wouldn't want me to say no to that just because we have a FaceTime date and I wouldn't want to give that up either. And the same for him, if um, he has something with work and he's going to get to know his coworkers from the hospital better. And, you know, he has something planned with me and he would have to say no. So I think it's really just been being patient with each other and and understanding of our schedules. But the time difference also has, (sighs) uh, you know, you know that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the three hours, um, I usually work n- close to nine hour days. And then especially when he was in his hospital rotations, he was working close to 10 hour days. So well, by the time I would wake up, he was at work. And then by the time I would leave, he was asleep. Mm. So it was also just finding joy in like the small, I think the small conversations, you know, it's like, you have, you realize that small things can make a big impact. You don't have to do these grand gestures to, to make the other first person feel loved. It's the fact that you like went on your lunch break and took the time to leave them a voicemail or send a nice text. (laughs) You know, it's, um, I would go and grab coffee and call him for a quick five minutes before I came back in instead of just, you know, having my time outside because, that was the five minutes we could fit in that day. And mm-hmm. um, I think it's also having something to look forward to, too. We've tried not to go more than, I think we've gone like two and a half or close to three months without seeing each other, but um, we've kind of made a pact to not go longer than that. You know, distance makes the heart grow fonder, but you also have to see each other <laughs> in person to maintain a relationship at some point. Um, so. I guess it's, you know, not rocket science and everyone kind of has to figure it out themselves. I wouldn't say we've had any sort of like, you know, crazy equation or plan. Yeah. Uh, It's just also been going with the flow. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree with almost everything you said there. Um, So for the audience that that if you don't know, my girlfriend was in New York um, and I'm in San Diego we're finally, hopefully this fall, going to be in the same city in Austin. But uh, so I did long distance with her for a couple years. And uh, we've similar um, issues, you know, the three hour time difference. And it's, you know, I wake up and work and then go work out. And by the time I'm done with all that, she's kind of gearing up for bed or she might be out doing something. But you're right, like the little the little check-ins throughout the day are like what really made both of our days it, you know, a simple text, like, Hey, just thinking about you or just the call, you know, driving to the gym, like, Hey, just tell me, tell me the best thing that happened in your day today. Like, you know, trying to, yep. trying to be a part of their life and understand their life a little bit and be engaged um, while you're, you know, 2,300, we're 2,900 miles away from each other. Um, and then you're totally right with just having something on the calendar to look forward to. Like we always, before we left, um, 
our our trip you know what if we were seeing each other before we left that we would try to figure out when's the next time we're going to see each other again so then we could restart the restart the the clock and it's like okay now it's 43 days again until we see each other and just like oh, always the going, <laughs> yeah yeah oh my gosh yeah so it, it, it's that it's not we we still we never really figured out like uh long distance dates or anything like that we would try our no. best like watch a movie together and then chat about it. But you're right. It's just like the little gestures and just like, just hoping for the moment, you know, waiting for the moments for us to reconnect and, and see each other were the big pieces to it. So I'm thinking that right now they're coming, you know, they have like Netflix party and all of these things because people are disconnected. And I think the real winners after all of this might be long distance relationships because oh, no. we can finally watch Netflix together. And that would be <laughs> exciting. We've always tried to like press play at the same time, be on FaceTime. It doesn't work. Ever, and then it buff, you know, buffers on one end and then you can hear the echo like five seconds ahead. Oh my gosh, yes, we have we have done all of that. Whenever we heard Netflix come <laughs> out, we're like, yes, finally, because she's a big movie buff too. So it's like yep. easy for us to do that. But it's like, and then I got to like, we got to try to get on the same schedule. Like she's popping popcorn at eight o'clock at night about to watch the movie. And it's like five o'clock and I'm kind of like rushing through work and I still haven't eaten. So it's just like yep. trying to figure out at least a moment where we can feel like we're in congruence on like what we're doing. But yeah, it's just like nothing beats the FaceTime. Like nothing beats like them coming and getting to see each other. But it, it it's, it's heartwarming because it's so awesome to get to see each other after s- waiting for so long there was like six to you know 12 week droughts where you're just like oh my gosh like it's got like and then it, the worst part is really like in that seven to ten day window like once you get close enough where you know it's coming and then every day yep. feels so long it's just like oh my gosh but you just can't yep. wait like pick them up from the airport or like cook them a hot meal or just like and it's just like hang out like the first day we see each other it's usually like i don't want to plan a whole lot like let's just yep lay on each other let's just look like let's just hang out and you know get some physical touch and whatnot because it's just like you've just been missing that so much from it so yeah uh so uh as we conclude here i i want to quickly just talk about a couple um key things for people to think about whenever making decisions specifically around their first job um so internships first jobs it's cool because i you you interned um with us and i I got to see you as an intern and i got to see you grow in your career um take a couple other internships and then take your first job in here so um could you leave us uh with some tips on some you know things that 20 year olds out of college should be thinking about you know, what should you really consider in a first job? And then maybe some things that don't matter as much whenever you're deciding a first job. Right. I think some some of the biggest things that I realized are regardless of the work itself, it's almost like the style of work or the style of the, the team or the company that's the most important. I think it's easy to get bogged down and these are like the tasks that I would want to do mm. where no two jobs you know if you had that at your internship unless you're going back to the same job probably not going to look like that because even if it's a competitor for example things are set up different and it's just not realistic I got some really good advice that one of my internships um, from a mentor and she was like think about your day at work and think about the things that bring you joy and the things that don't and kind of boiling it down to the task but then applying that broadly was really helpful for me. I realized I really don't like project work. Um, I guess maybe just in the experience that I had, I think, for example, in the insurance world, something I'm more of like a cyclical or client oriented um, style is, is more of what I like versus doing, I guess, maybe not necessarily project work, but having one single project that you work on for months at a time mm-hmm. and you don't have anything else, you know, you need, or from my perspective, I needed to be able to still to get away from my one piece of work, but still do work versus, you know, taking a walk. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was an important realization for me and, and applies pretty broadly at, at different companies. I think, you know, standard advice that you get to that, the people are really what matters. You could love your job, but if you hate the people you work with, you're going to be pretty miserable versus vice versa, I think is a little bit more bearable. So it's, I think, really important that when you're interviewing, 
you're not just being interviewed, that you're actually asking questions that you want to know and really digesting what those people are saying to you. Um, because generally it's someone that's going to be your manager or at least, you know, in the office or on your team. And if, again, I got feeling if you don't really vibe with that person or you think I wouldn't want to sit next to this person or work with them every day, then that might be telling you that's probably not the right, the right job for you. No, that, that totally makes sense to me too. Um, and I liked your advice on like, you're not the only one that's being interviewed. It, I, I tell, especially young people and students and, um, you know, people looking for their first jobs, like, you know, you should be interviewing like you would be dating. Like, it's not like you're showing up to the table and you're just hoping she or he likes you. You're showing up to the table and yes, of course, showing your best self and, and, and you know, trying to get an opportunity, but also vetting the opportunity in front of you as well and deciding, do you like that opportunity as well? Do you want to come back on a second date? Do you see yourself dating this person? Do you see a potential marriage in the future? Um, and that's very hard, once again, as a first date or a second date to, to see, you know, decide if, if this is a marriage partner, but you're right, you know, you've been on plenty of dates realizing like, this is not the right fit for me. Um, so doing a little bit more proactive work, I think, during those interviews and not just being so worried about what you say, but also, you know, what questions you ask and, and how and how they're responding to some of those questions. Right. And I think generally, I, I guess I might be in the minority here, but um, I like interviews. Generally, Same. I like meeting people and talking to people. Yeah, not shocked. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's just fun to get to know people. And I think also when you think about it like that, you take the pressure off of yourself. Like, I'm just trying to get to know this person and they're trying to get to know me. So mm -hmm. that's a good mindset. But also, even if you don't necessarily love interviews, I think if it's the worst experience of your life and I had one of those and you just go out feeling horrible about yourself and that you, you know, there's always self-doubt. Like, I didn't answer that one question right. But if you were like, that was just the worst half hour I've ever had in my life. And you probably, again, know that's probably not the job. Even if they give you the job and maybe you did great, if you really hated it, then that's probably not the, you know, maybe it was the style of the interview the, and you didn't like that. Well, that company obviously likes that style and operates that way. Um, again, if it's the person, I think there's just a lot of different factors that maybe you don't have to directly analyze. Um, but if you just leave the interview thinking about how you, felt during it if you felt you know motivated or uplifted or torn down then that kind of leads leads you to believe things too yeah no doubt no doubt well Kate um I, I got some Chinese waiting for me you know that so uh, you know <laughs> so I'm so thankful for you to uh come on the sandbox I I uh love the wide-ranging conversation that we had you know from deciding on college to moving and, and working processing processing through moving and how to deal with long distance relationships. We, we tackled a lot here and that was really fun. And yep. I'm so thankful that you did push yourself outside your comfort zone and uh, came on here. And hopefully whenever you're re-listening to this right now, um, that the sound of your voice has gotten a little bit more familiar <laughs> and comfortable with you. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> well, Kate, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Uh, if people want to connect with you, if they resonated with something and they have a follow-up question for you, what's a good place for people to reach out? Instagram works. My uh, username is Kate, K-A-T-E underscore Holt, H-O-L-T-Z. Um, also on LinkedIn works too, just by searching my name. So. Perfect. Awesome. And we'll, we'll put those links down in this description below. A few final thoughts from me before I conclude this episode. First of all, huge shout out to Kate. She was nervous to come on the show, but despite all of that, she is such a badass and she followed through with her commitment. We giggled the entire show. She is such a good friend of mine, and I'm so excited to see what life has in store for her. I hope hearing a little bit of her story encourages you to break outside your comfort zone as well. She really inspired me to start following my intuition more. I'm so bad about using too much logic, and ironically, that often impairs me from making the right decision. My ask to you is if you enjoyed this, this episode, subscribe to the show, share it with a friend, and show me some love on social. I am at Justin Lee Peters. That would mean a lot to me as this show is new and growing. That's it for me. New episodes out every other Monday, and I'll see you next time in the sandbox.